Hello and welcome back to our last module of this unit, the Church, the Sacrament of Salvation. Hopefully by now we have a good grasp on how things work in the class. Again, always keep emailing me or contacting me if you need any help. Uh, and this will be the last module of this unit. So after this module, we'll move on to our first unit assessment that will be posted on Canvas. Uh, just a recap of this unit. So we started the first module by looking at what sacraments are and how we can see the world sacramentally. The last unit, we looked at how Jesus is the prime sacrament, the prime visible sign that makes God present to us. That if we want to know who God the Father is, simply to turn to Jesus. But now we see that the church is also a sacrament. That while Jesus is the prime example of who God the Father is and who God is, that he left the church to continue to be that visible sign in that world. So let's look at the church as sacrament then. So first, just like we do with Jesus to see who is God or what is God, first of all, what is the church? Well, the church is very much a who, not a what. So a lot of times we think of the church as this institution or as a hierarchy or as a, as a building, but really the church is a people. We may think of the Greek word ecclesia, uh, Greek for church. This is different than the word we might think of a church building, which is the word kirch. Kirch means a church building. To say church is not to say a building, but first and foremost, those who have been called forth by Christ. We also like koinonia, the Greek word for community, those who have been gathered together. And what have we been gathered together to do? To proclaim the kerygma, the kerygma, that heart of the gospel message. So why do we need church? Why, why do we need any of this? Well, Jesus could have simply came down as, as an adult, died for us and left. But everything God chose to do, he decided to do in community. He decided to be born into a family. He decided to call apostles together, disciples together. He decided to leave individuals in his stead to continue his work as a community. And we see this in Acts. So we've been called together by Christ to be a community. But a lot of times we get wrapped up in what the community is not. We might look at the church and say, you know, I get nothing out of church or the church is simply rules and regulations. And from an outside perspective, I can understand that. But remember that Jesus came to proclaim a, a message first of the heart. And so really said that if we do not understand the value first of what God is calling us to, remember, first and foremost, God calls us to a relationship, not rules and regulations. There's a place for them, for commandments and expectations in any kind of relationship. If you think of any relationship that you're in, romantic or otherwise, there are generally expectations in that relationship. Uh, you know, I'm, in my marriage, I, I took certain vows. And so there are now certain boundaries and rules I have taken upon myself. I cannot simply go and be unfaithful and, and start a relationship with someone else. I have vowed myself to be faithful to my wife. And I can sit here and be upset about how I can't be with another person. I'm not. Uh, but, or I can realize that for this relationship in my life to be healthy, there are certain things I can and it can do and should do and things that I can't do and shouldn't do. And so the same is with a relationship with God, but it starts with first understanding that it's a relationship and the church is a relationship. We may talk about a personal relationship with Christ. Well, how can I just, why can't I just have a personal relationship with Christ? Uh, I just have church in my heart, for example, you know, God is everywhere. Why do I need to be part of the community? Well, kind of like we said earlier before, everything Christ did was in community. So if Christ just wanted us to do things individually, he wouldn't have called believers together to form that community to be and work with each other. And partly it's because he knows no person is an island. As much as we like to, to front and, and to act like I can do everything myself, the idea of a self-made man is, or a self-made human is, is unrealistic. All of us get to where we are because of the help of others. And so likewise, we need the community, we need relationships, we need to come together. And so Paul uses this example of the body of Christ, that though many parts, we form one body with Christ as the head. And that we all bring different things to the table that are needed. So not everyone can be an ear or else we wouldn't have the sense of taste. Not everyone can be a hand or else we wouldn't have the sense of sight. Our differentiation, our differences are what make us a working body. So if you're not there, if I'm not there, there's a key integral part of the church that's missing so the church won't work properly. So a lot of times when we see things in a church that are, are difficult or, or struggles or issues, the answer is not to leave. The answer is actually to stay and be a part and to work 
to help make it better, to help it make it the body of Christ Christ called it to be. We have not just, we're not just called to be with each other. I can even buy that when we say, you know, I have friends that I hang out with, that I have relationships. But our goal as a church is not simply to be together as friends. We're also called to be together with a purpose, to proclaim, to live, to build the kingdom. And because of that, we need a specific relationship. We also need the community in the sense that, you know, as individuals, how do we know if what we're thinking is right? How do we know if what we believe about God is, is right? You know, how do I know if the image of God I have in my head, I just didn't create myself and kind of reflects more me than it does who God actually is? You know, that can be a temptation. Well, we turn to the church community as a check and balance. Well, what, is, what does the church believe? What is the community saying? Uh, what, how is God speaking through the church through us? And so it kind of also poses a checks and balance so that way we're not just kind of making things up in our own mind, but rather are actually accepting in our head and in our heart what God, who God is actually revealing God's self to be, to know it's actually true. So let's look a little bit more at this who. We refer to the communion of saints in the creed. We believe, we say we believe in the communion of saints. So what is the communion of saints? The communion of saints is not just all those who made it to big time in heaven. It's everyone in heaven, those who have died and have gone to be in perfect union with God in heaven. Those on earth, so those of us still fighting the good fight, still trying to do the will of God, still carrying our crosses, still, still tra uh, trudging on the journey. And those in purgatory, so those who have died but have not yet entered heaven because there is some kind of sin on their soul. And so heaven is a perfect union with God, that is perfect love. So sin is a choice not to love. So we need to remove that desire not to love. Anything that's been left on our soul, any selfishness left on our soul at the hour of our death is purified. And really that actually shows the great mercy of God that, you know, you don't have to be perfect. You should strive for perfectness, holiness. However, God knows it's hard. And so because of that, when we fail, but we have still led a life that is seeking after God, God allows us to be purified of what keeps us from him so that way we can be in perfect union with God in heaven. So all those in heaven, in purgatory, and on earth. We are all called to be saints. So saints are extraordinary holy witnesses of God's love and mission. So if you want to see perfect visible signs of God in the world, look to the saints. And there's big S saint and little s saint. Big S saint are those who we know are saints in heaven, who uh, have been confirmed through a process that God has worked miracles uh, through their intercession. So if God has worked miracles through the intercession, they're not going to be in hell, they're going to be in heaven. A note on that, this idea of praying to saints and miracles. Well, how can we pray to saints sometimes, people might ask. Well, think of it this way. I may ask you to pray for me, and, and well, please pray for me. I need it. Uh, but I can ask you to pray for me because we support one another and God even said to pray, uh, pray for one another and we see in Acts that they pray for one another, to support one another. Well, Jesus' death conquered sin and death. Death has no more power over us because of Christ. And so saints in heaven, saints on earth, uh, we're all united as one family. So asking the saint in heaven to pray for us is the same as me asking you to pray for me. I'm asking my family member in heaven, my family member on earth, to pray for me. Uh, and so when, when we say a miracle is worked through the inter or, or prayer is answered in the session of the saint, God is the source of all prayer, of all grace, of all miracles. God, only God does all of that. And it's simply recognizing that God works that, hearing not only our prayer, but the prayers of our family members who have petitioned God. I mean, a lot of times when there might be an issue in the family or an illness, we might say, ask everyone we know, please pray for this person, pray for us, pray for us. Is this family member, this, this family coming together, asking God, and we say, God has heard our, not just my, but our prayer. And so in the same way, Jesus hears our prayer, not discriminating whether that family member is in heaven or on earth. And the same with Mary. Mary is not God, but if if Jesus hears us, his children, how many more times would he not listen to his own his own mother? You know, we're called to love our parents. You'd like to think Jesus would, of course, love his own mother and and hear what she has to say uh, in terms of her request as well. Uh, also, as saints, so we talked a little bit before about the idea of working for the church, helping to be a part of it. We're supposed to use the talents that God gave us, what we call our charism. So, what's your gift? What's your talent? 
you know, you could be a saint. One day there could be a little saint card with your name on it. You know, the patron saint of puppies, patron saint of midnight snacks. I want that one. You know, what are we known for? What's our gifts? What are our talents? And how can you use it to build the church? Look at St. Francis, whose image is on the screen. St. Francis existed in a time of great issue and difficulty in the church. And sometimes we can become very disillusioned with different issues that rise in the church and different scandal. But the answer again is not to leave. Francis could have left very easily. But rather, Francis used his gifts, his talents, and he heard God call to him and say, rebuild my church. And he took it to heart. And by all his work, proclamation of the gospel, his acts of service, his love of poverty, the finding of the order of friars minor, the Franciscans, he renewed the church. And so we too are called to be new Christ, new Francis's in our own world, to use our gifts to not separate from, but to rebuild and to continue to build the church. And in that way, we're visible signs of Jesus in the world. St. Teresa of Avila says, I have no hand, Christ has no hands, no feet, but yours. So if someone doesn't know who Christ is, it's because we're not showing it to them. St. Therese of Lisieux, also pictured on your screen, talks about the little way, doing great acts of uh, love and little things each day, great love and little things each day. How can we just make it a habit each day that through the little things, not just the big things, but also the little things, be visible signs of God's love? And then this way, we can work towards union with God, holiness, and help others to become holy as well. We think of the church as mysteries, all these different images and models of the church. Uh, Cardinal Avery Dulles was very famous uh, for creating these five and then later six models of the church, of, of which one of them is the church's sacrament. But we'll see the church in a general sense as mystery. And you'll see a lot of times these images for the church have more to do with who God is and the church reflecting God. So God is a mystery. We cannot fully understand and comprehend God. God is beyond us. And so the way that God works through the church to continue to give us grace is also a mystery. Something that is not always visible, but it manifests itself in the way that we act and work and we do and what we do. So what is it that we do to make manifest, make visible the invisible, mysterious work of God? We're called to kerygma. We talked about this before, the proclamation of the gospel message, in our, in our, not just in our words, but also in our actions. Through our life as a community, we talk about as koinonia. So God calls together as community. So as a community, we experience who God is. As community, we travel towards holiness. As community, we build the kingdom of God. Diakonia, the Greek word for service. We're called to sacrifice of ourselves for others, to give of ourselves. This isn't just you know giving money to charity. This is sacrificing our time, time in our day to love another, uh, whether it's the, the least of these, that one which is in need, someone who's on the other side of the globe going through difficulty, or someone in our own home. And worship the Lord, the Greek word liturgia, when we talk about liturgy from module one, the idea of, of giving praise to God. So by praising God, serving God and others, coming together as a community, and proclaiming God's good news, God works through us to bring salvation to the world, to extend the salvation of the cross. So let's put this into more formal terms. The church is sacrament, a sign of grace, instituted by Christ that dispenses grace. So the church is a sign of grace because, quite frankly, um, it is the visible sign of God now on earth. So Jesus was the visible sign of the Father that made God known to us. And when, after he ascended into heaven, left the church those he gathered together to be a visible sign in the world of who God is. And so by being God's hands and feet, by the way we live our lives, by what we do, by how we proclaim the gospel, we can help others know God. We can help others know others. We can help be a visible sign of God towards others. That's really why we have to be very careful by the way we live our lives. You know, I've been told to me before uh, the saying that some people say, well, I don't want to go to church because there are hypocrites there. Well, in one way, saying that I don't want to go to church because there are hypocrites there, like saying, you know, I don't want to go to the gym because there's fat people there. Well, what's the gym serve is, is to help people get into shape or stay in shape, right? Not trying to judge or make anyone feel uncomfortable. But in the same way, we're all kind of out of shape in our relationship with God. We're all kind of out of shape in our spiritual life. So really, the church should be filled with sinners because we're sinners. Uh, and so the church is supposed to be a sign to everyone in that regard, too, of God's love and mercy and forgiveness, not simply perfection. We're working towards there. We're not there yet. 
we've been instituted. So quite literally, Jesus called these believers together, called this church community together, and left them at the hands of the apostles. We see in the beginning of Acts, the 12 apostles, 11, then with the auction Matthias, 12, leading the community that they're gathered in the upper room in Jerusalem, and very clearly led by St. Peter as their spokesperson, if you will, the first among many. And so we've kind of carried that throughout the ages. And lastly, dispenses grace. So just like the sacraments only function because of who Jesus is, the church only functions because of who Jesus is, that the church does not create grace. Only God creates grace in a manner of speaking um, through his death on the cross. So only Jesus' death on the cross is what saves us. But the church is a channel of grace. So, the, so God uses the church to make his grace present now in real and visible ways. So those who experience Jesus experience God's presence in a very real and tangible way. And so the church is now supposed to continue that after Jesus's, um, after Jesus's uh, ascension. And so in that way, we, we might uh, be said to dispense grace, and particularly through uh, the administration of, of the sacraments. So how does the church do this? Well, we might look to the four marks of the church. We profess this in the creed, I believe, in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And they're really characteristics that show how the church functions as a visible sign of God in the world. So we may say that the church is a sign of oneness. It is united in one God, in one faith we proclaim the same creed, and in one worship. No matter where you go in the world, it will be the same sacraments, the same mass. Granted, it will take its own flavor in its own location, but it will be the same readings. It will be the same flow, the same rituals. And so all this oneness, why it is always the same, is to show that we are united. Church is holy. So the church is primarily holy not because we're holy. Remember, we're sinners. We're working towards holiness, but we're not holy yet but because God is holy. So sometimes as a church we fail, excuse me, or individuals within the church fail to, to live up to what God has called us to. And sometimes by doing things that are very uh, egregious and that really leave us kind of wondering, you know, why am I still part of this church when certain people have done some pretty terrible things? Well, that's because that the church's holiness is not dependent on us. If it was dependent on us, there'd be no hope. But because it's dependent first on God, we have the hope and the ability that we can actually reach holiness one day. So the church is holy because it's striving towards holiness because God is holy. The church is Catholic, meaning it's for universal. It exists for everyone, everywhere, at all times. Uh, the church is not just for a clique or a certain group of people, but is meant to serve and to exist and to call forth everyone regardless of qualification. And it's apostolic. To be an apostle means to be a messenger. Being a disciple is a follower. Being an apostle is a messenger. So we come to the church as disciples, as followers, and hopefully we leave each week as apostles, messengers. And so we're founded first on the original messengers, the 12 apostles who were tasked with commissioning and who were commissioned with spreading and uh, that message and overseeing the church and doing that. And in that regard, the church is apostolic in that it has apostolic succession. So the modern day apostles, the bishops, can trace their uh, apostolic authority all the way back to the original 12 apostles because those apostles left successors and then no successors left successors etc to keep things going until we have the bishops of today. So this unbroken chain of bishops not only cements uh, this church's heritage as being the true church of Christ that Christ founded but also cements it in having the authority that it has given to it by Jesus Christ. Remember the church's authority is not of its own it's of Christ but it was passed on given by Christ to his apostles. So a lot of times we might we might wonder uh, you know how has the church lasted this long it, it, and really this is the testament that the Holy Spirit in Christ is the one guiding the church. You know, if, if it, the church was not guided by the Holy Spirit, it would have probably destroyed itself and caved in centuries ago as many other empires and institutions have that lasted a while but eventually came to pass and are now history. But the, that the church existed for 2,000 years and it is it still existing despite all its self-inflicted wounds in many ways and the wounds inflicted upon it by others is testament that it really is the Holy Spirit guiding the church and not just, just human made. So let's look at some of the signs that the church uses. Besides the seven sacraments, 
the church used what's called the liturgical year. So we have this calendar. We have the yearly calendar that goes from January 1st to December 31st, or the academic calendar that goes from the beginning of September to the end of, of June-ish. Uh, the liturgical calendar begins with Advent, about the last weekend of November usually, and finishes with the end of second ordinary, ordinary time around the Feast of, of uh, Christ the King. And so this whole use of feast days, colors, seasons, is itself signs that show us what we believe uh, as as Catholics. That we might, you know, we believe that Jesus rose for us. So we have the feast day and this, the season of Easter. That we believe that we should seek repentance with God. So we have a season of Lent with the color purple that signifies repentance. For Catholics and Christians, quite frankly, Sunday is the primary day of worship. So we call to mind the third commandment of keep holy the Sabbath day. Because of Jesus' resurrection on a Sunday, our primary day of worship is on Sunday. So we are called to, to worship God each Sunday as living up to one of the expectations of our relationship with God. So God, in setting the expectations for relationship in the Ten Commandments, asked us to set aside time to be in a relationship with him, to focus on him. And, and quite frankly, any good relationship requires that. Uh, if we if we want to work on our friendship, we should spend time and reach out and communicate with that person. The same thing is with God, to set aside that time to spend with God each Sunday. In addition to our obligation to go to church and, and go to Mass each Sunday, there are six other days for Catholics that are, require, that are called, deemed just as important. So we dedicate New Year's Day, uh, January 1st, to the Mother of God. We have 40 days after Easter, which changes based on the lunar calendar, based on Passover, uh, the Ascension, when Jesus ascended into heaven, body and soul. We have the Assumption on August 15th, which is when Mary, after she died, was taken body and soul into heaven, uh, because since she was made pure through the Immaculate Conception, where she was conceived without original sin, so that even the vessel that carried Jesus uh, was without sin, Jesus would not allow her body to be corrupted, so body and soul, she was taken to heaven. November 1st, All Saints Day, which actually makes part of a lesser known triduum. Uh, we think of the triduum as Holy Thursday, Good Friday, into Easter Sunday. There's another triduum in the church, which is Halloween, All Saints Day, and All Souls Day. Halloween uh, coming from All Hallows' Eve, which is the old English way of saying the Eve of all the hallowed ones, the Eve of All Saints Day. So really, Halloween has its roots in Catholicism. So we celebrate All Hallows' Eve, the Eve of All Saints Day, All Saints Day, and then All Souls Day. We recall our loved ones who have passed from this life to the next. So it's really a triduum about the communion of saints, if you will. The Immaculate Conception we just talked about. So the belief that Mary needed a Savior, uh, but since God is not bound by time and space, the grace, the sanctifying and salvific grace of the cross was given to Mary at her conception. And finally, Christmas, uh, because Christmas does not always fall on a Sunday and it is essential to our faith, Jesus' birth. You'll notice Easter is not on this list of six because Easter always falls on a Sunday, Easter Sunday. And so it is always just automatically a day of obligation. The liturgical year, so we'll see the calendar uh, uh, on the screen, begins really the end of November, beginning of December with Advent, which will go for four weeks of preparation before Christmas. Christmas, which begins on Christmas Day. I know a lot of times we have the temptation to uh, finish uh, Christmas on Christmas Day and then not celebrate anymore, but Christmas actually begins on Christmas Day, and then we celebrate it for 12 days afterwards. Then we have the first ordinary time. Ordinary time is a season where we recall Jesus' ministry, his teachings, and he shows us how to live through his life. Then we have Lent, a 40-day period of preparation for Easter that recalls Jesus' 40 days in the desert preparing for his ministry. It's a time of penance, kind of a spring cleaning of our, of our faith, if you will. Then Triduum. The Triduum is the shortest season of the year, three days, Good Friday, Holy Thursday, into Easter Sunday. We remember Jesus' passion. And then we celebrate Easter Sunday. Easter is actually not just one day, it's an octave, an eight day long celebration. And the season of Easter is 50 days. We actually celebrate Easter for quite some time because it's really the pinnacle of our faith as Christians. And then we go into the second ordinary time where we recall the rest of Jesus' ministry and what he taught and did for us. So in addition to the liturgical year, we prayer and what we call sacramentals are also essential to our, our faith. So prayer is, in any good relationship, you'll talk to any couple, any married couple, any relationship, communication is key. So it's our relationship. So sometimes we're like, you know, we're at church, like, you know, I don't, 
you know, I don't experience God, but what effort are we putting into it? You know, God is trying. Our, what effort are we putting into it? If we kind of just show up and, and don't are open and don't want to be open and don't put an effort in, uh, we're, it's not going to be as effective for us or we're not going to be able to experience God as well as we could. Uh, and so part of that is becoming attuned to how God communicates. So God is beyond physical, physical uh, physicality. You know, we communicate through words and sounds and actions, and so does God, but God transcends the physical world. He is omnipotent and omnipresent, uh, is Alpha and Omega beginning and end. So it reasons that if God is beyond the physical realm, then God is also beyond physical means of communication. So we have to come to tune how God communicates with us. Is God communicating to us through a sense of peace? Does God communicate through us through silence? Does God communicate through us through someone else? Does God communicate to us through the sacraments, through the word of God, through the readings? So we have to, it's a habit we have to build. The more we pray, the better we can get at that communication. You may think of someone who might be socially awkward in social situations, doesn't really know how to talk with other people. Maybe it's you, sometimes it's me. I feel a lot of times when we struggle with prayer, it just means we're socially awkward with God. We don't, we don't have to communicate, but in the same way, we just have to keep talking with others and being in social situations and we can develop better ways of, of communicating with others. In the same way, the more we pray, the better we can in being with that situation with God. The only difference is God loves us regardless, doesn't think we're awkward, so it works. Um, different kinds of prayers. Prayers of petition, we ask God for something. Prayers of adoration, we just simply adore God for who God is. Prayers of contrition, we ask God that we're, for forgiveness, that I'm sorry. And prayers of thanksgiving. And quite frankly, that follows human forms of communication. We thank each other. We say, I'm sorry. We praise each other. We ask things of each other. And so it follows the same way with God. Mass is ultimately the greatest form of prayer. But their forms of prayer include meditation. Lexo Divina, praying with scripture, meditating on scripture passage, what God might be telling us. The rosary, uh, praying, uh, rest, reciting the same prayer again and again, a form of meditation, focusing on the Gospels. Liturgy of the Hours. So this was an ancient form of prayer that at certain hours throughout the day, certain readings and psalms and prayers would be read to continue kind of the celebration of the Mass. And Eucharistic Adoration, spending time before Jesus' real presence in the Eucharist uh, in simply adoration and, and, excuse me, thanksgiving to God. We also think of sacramentals. So the church, as we see now, use a lot of signs, visible signs. The physical world is good. Uh, we can see God through the physical world, uh, through creation, what St. Bonaventure called the vestiges of creation, that if God created the universe, then by studying the universe, by knowing more about the universe, that we can know more about God. So physical things are good. Uh, and so we also use physical things to make us focus more on God, who is ultimately who we worship. And so we might think, use things like a crucifix or a cross to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. We might sign ourselves with the sign of the cross to again remember what Christ did for us. We might light a candle when Jesus said he is the light of the world to remember Jesus' presence. We might bless ourselves with holy water, uh, remembering Jesus' baptism that Jesus washed us to sin. We might use rosary beads as a, as a tool for prayer. A scapular, which Mary uh, gave to St. Simon Stock as a reminder of Mary's constant protection as the mother of God and mother of us. And we might think of, of different medals that were, were given as a reminder not only of, of, of different saints who have gone before us, or Mary, or Jesus, uh, similar to maybe having a, a picture of, of a loved one in a similar way that we might have statues. We don't worship statues. Uh, if you're worshiping a statue, you're, you're going against church teaching, quite frankly. Uh, we do not believe in idol worship. Uh, but similarly, like you have a picture of your grandmother on your mantle, or of your best friends, uh, or a picture on your lock screen on your phone. Uh, statues developed as an ancient form of artwork, uh, in the same way as icons, uh, to remind us of our family members in heaven, to remind us of Christ, to remind us of, uh, of what Christ did for us. We do not worship those things. They serve as reminders of us, uh, I'm sorry, reminders to us of who God is. They are, again, visible signs. And that comes into that sacramental worldview of seeing all things in this world as good and pointing to God. So that is the conclusion of our, of this module, a little bit longer this week, so I appreciate you hanging in with us, but there's a lot to cover in these first couple modules, and then we'll kind of break it up as it goes along. Uh, but hopefully this can kind of show how the church is a visible sign to the world. 
and I'll invite you to go into the materials for the rest of this module. And after that, you'll have a week to complete your first unit assessment, which will be posted. And again, if you have any questions or concerns on that, please feel free to contact me. Other than that, until next time, have a good one.